Hello. I've called my faith moment for today. He's behind you. Now, if you've ever had the joy of going to see a pantomime or a stage production with a large group of children like I have, you'll know that when it comes to the classic scene where the monster or the villain is behind the back of a supposedly innocent character, it sends the children wild. The guaranteed to be shouting at the top of their voices, he's behind you. It's one of the oldest and most effective dramatic devices. It's called dramatic irony. People in the audience know more than the characters on stage and it gives them a certain fearing of superiority, which they enjoy. But you know, adults fall for this device every bit as much as children. We can get this feeling when we're watching the film. We see an innocent character walking towards the door handle of a spooky cellar or an attic where they shouldn't go. And as we watch them reach out their hand to the door handle of the place that will approach their doom, we can almost feel ourselves calling out, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It's a clever way of making us feeling involved in a story because it makes us have this superior feeling of knowledge. But what's all of this got to do with a faith moment, you may be asking? Well, my faith moment for today is based on the story of the road to Emmaus, where the disciples, two of Jesus' disciples, are walking along, debating what happened in the crucifixion and the events of the resurrection. And Jesus himself turns up and accompanies them. But Luke tells us they were kept from recognising him. And Jesus asks the disciples what they're discussing. That's very like Jesus, isn't it? He, he, he asks us what we're doing and he waits for us to be ready to answer. He comes to us where we are and where we're up to, I think. And Cleopas talks to Jesus like he's the daft one. He says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? And Jesus asks him, what things? And he goes on to explain, he says, we'd hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And then he explains about the crucifixion. Um, and he says, it's now the third day since these things happened. And when we read this story again, we're thinking, come on, come on, get with the program. Um, get the clue, you know, the third day. Um, and the disciples go on and explain that the women went to the tomb and that they'd seen the vision of angels who'd said that Jesus was alive and that then some of their companions, some of the men, went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And again, we can almost feel ourselves shouting, but you're talking to him. Um, and Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then he says to them, beginning with Moses, or the gospel says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, do you know what? I'm I'm very fond of the Bible and of Bible study. And some of you know that I have a little Bible study group every other every other week on a Thursday at All Saints Church and one of the things I've found very much more enriching than I expected to to be honest with you has been looking at some of the Old Testament um, books of the Old Testament particularly looking at Genesis and more recently looking at Exodus and seeing how much of Jesus we really can find in the Old Testament and in John Mountain's faith moments recently, he's been talking about the things that are in the temple in the book of Exodus. And we're seeing how much of Jesus' ministry fulfills what was spoken about in the Old Testament. And I tell you what, this Bible study, can you imagine how good it would have been? How good it would be like to be a fly on the wall or to be there and hear Jesus himself explaining to the, to the disciples the significance of what's said about him in the Old Testament. It always excites me that bit. 
And then, of course, the disciples finally recognise him when Jesus takes bread and he broke it and gave it to them. And then, in the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened and they recognised him. But just at that moment, he disappeared from sight. I'm thinking, that must have been hard. You know, you finally recognise him, he's finally there, you finally know. And just, just at that moment, he disappears from sight. What's that about? And then afterwards, the disciples say to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I think, well, are we? When we read it, we think, oh, yeah, it's obviously it was Jesus. But would we not have been the same if we were the disciples who were walking on the road to, to, to Emmaus? Wouldn't we have been like that? Does so often our common sense, as we think, override our faith? I saw, I, I can't find it, but I saw a really good little cartoon of one of the disciples sitting at, at, a, at a picnic going, I know he was really special, but dead men don't come back. And then he goes, oh, he's standing behind me, isn't he? And that's the thing with Jesus. He often is standing behind us. So I think the way that this story is written, which is very clever, is so much more than just a literary device. And I was having to think about what I thought Jesus was doing in this passage and what this passage was teaching them and what this passage can teach us. Well, I think, first of all, he was training them and training us to walk by faith and not by sight. The disciples were used to being around Jesus and seeing him. And very shortly after the ascension, they wouldn't be able to physically see him. They'd have to get used to walking by faith and not by sight, as we have to. And the passage also reminds us, I think, to listen when our hearts are burning within us, to listen to the voice of the Spirit, not to quench it, not to think that can't be, because things can be with Jesus, to listen to that voice of the Spirit. And of course, the disciples find Jesus in a place where we can find him. They look for him and find him in the scriptures. And the study of the Old Testament scriptures and looking for Jesus in the scriptures is a really blessed and productive thing to do. And of course, they also find Jesus in the breaking of the bread as we commemorate in our Eucharist or communion services. So you see, Jesus really is behind you in another sense of the phrase, like we might say that we get behind a football team because he always is there behind us, supporting us, encouraging us and loving us. And he wants us too to recognise that, to know that he's there with us as he walks with us and as we walk with him.